Hey, welcome to Bennett's uh, Chemistry 12 tutorials again. Uh, so we're in the middle of the titration unit and as a matter of fact, we're getting to the last concept that we need to cover here in the titration unit. Um, and that concept is titration curves. So um, it's a little bit more of a visual representation of what's going on during a titration. Um, super important to understand because sometimes titration curves are your only source of information that will provide very specific information about an, an acid or a base that you can't get uh, elsewhere. Um, and so kind of understanding the, the um, subtleties of these curves uh, will help you start to identify true unknowns and kind of the composition of the unknown and a whole bunch of other things that we're, gonna, we're going to be looking at. Okay, so we'll be identifying all those little individual features that are um, associated with titration curves. And that will be our last thing in the titration unit. Uh, and then we'll proceed to the reduction oxidation unit, which is usually the last unit you cover in chemistry 12. So uh, this is going to be an introductory session here for titration curves. I've decided to, cut, to split them because um, you can go into quite a bit of detail when you're talking about uh, strong bases, weak, or sorry, uh, strong base, weak acid, or strong acid, weak base uh, titrations. They can, the curves get pretty detailed and you can go into quite a bit of detail. You gotta, you gotta get into what is a buffer, um, why is there a buffer, why is this thing different, what's going on, so it gets a little bit more complicated. And so you'll see, we need a little bit more time for that one. So this one's just going to be, as you can see, kind of over here, over my shoulder, uh, it's going to be covering two things. So first thing it's going to cover is what is the general concept of a titration curve? And you can probably already guess what it's going to be. Uh, and within that, what is the concept or what is that uh, concept of a titration curve? Some of the general um, identifying features of a uh, titration curve, things that apply to all titration curves regardless of what titration you're doing, and understanding why those things are general or generally apply to all titrations. And then the second thing we'll do is I'll, I'll go into the strong, strong titration curve, which is um, one category of titration that you would be doing if you were titrating a strong acid with a weak or a strong base, or a strong base using a strong acid. So the titration curve that you get from that type of a titration is, is different um, from a strong weak combination. And so therefore we're gonna look at that one. It's a little bit more straightforward, a little bit more un, uh, easier to understand right off the bat. And then you can apply some of the general concepts and carry them over into the strong weak that we'll go into next uh, video. Okay, so. What is the concept of a titration curve? So a titration curve is essentially monitoring the pH of a solution as you do the titration. So imagine for a sec, someone asks you, okay, I want you to um, collect data so that you can draw a titration curve. So what would that look like? So you'd set up your titration, you'd have your burette, you put your titrant into the burette, the thing with known concentration. Down below in an Erlenmeyer flask, you'd have your unknown sample with a measured volume of it. Now, what you would normally do in a titration is you'd add your indicator and you'd just start adding the titrant in until you reached equivalence. And you, sorry, until you reach the end point where the indicator changed color and then you'd stop and you'd do all the math associated with it. Titration curves are slightly different in that before you get going, you put a pH probe down into the Erlenmeyer flask. And so there is kind of a, a there's some technology involved here. So the, the pH is going to be monitored as you go ahead and do it, right? So you're still gonna do the titration. You're still gonna mix the titrant into the unknown, swirl it around, you can even add indicator if you want, but you are going to monitor the pH, say every I don't know, mil, half mil, whatever you're, you're going to do. Of course, if you were just doing it manually, you'd have your, you know, your piece of paper over on the side and you go, okay, what's the pH at zero mils of titrant added? And you'd write it down and then you'd add a mil and swirl it around. You'd measure the pH and write it down. 
two mils, write it down, three mils, and so on and so on and so forth. Of course, we have technology nowadays where um, most of you will probably have access to a pH probe that you can hook up to a computer, and you can do the titration, and the data is just collected by the computer, right? And so you can actually do that, whether it's the PASCO software or some other software that you're actually using. The computer kind of does all the data collection and draws the graph free and everything else. So the programs nowadays are kind of cool. But the concept is that you're not just kind of adding haphazardly and then when the colors start, you get an indication that the color's about to change, you slow down and then go drop by drop. It's almost like you don't care when you're doing a titration curve. You don't care about the end point and the color change. Like you can do a titration curve without using an indicator at all. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to use your understanding of the pH change to find out where the uh, equivalence point actually was. Okay, and so that's what you're going to do. So over here on the board, I've got a kind of the axes of a graph set up already. So when you're doing a titration curve, you're going to see your, your typical vertical axis being pH. And that will be pH of the solution down in the Erlenmeyer flask. So that's where you're putting your pH probe and you're going to measure that. And then you'll down here you will have your volume of whatever you have in the beer at, adding in, okay, and you call that the titrant. So you're talking about, I don't know, if you had an acid down below in the Erlenmeyer flask and up above you have sodium hydroxide, then you'd say volume of sodium hydroxide added, okay, and you'd start at zero, and then you would go up in your increments, whatever they might be, right, and you'd have your nice little graph, and you'd go every mill or whatever you would do. And so you'd be going along, and you'd stop at one mil, measure the pH, stop at two mils, measure the pH, stop at three mils, measure the pH, so on and so on and so forth. Okay, and then the pH, you'd just, you'd monitor the pH, and you would see what's going on. Now, in your head, you might be thinking, hmm, well that might be pretty, like, wouldn't it just kind of do that? It wouldn't it just, like if you were titrating an acid down below, it would start, pH would start low and it'd go high. How do you tell anything? That might have gone on in your head. That's not what it does. It doesn't do that, okay? It's not that simple. The graph, though, is extremely identifiable, okay? So you'll, you'll as soon as you see this curve, the shape of the curve will kind of stick in your head because it's very identifiable, okay? So what is the concept? We're adding titrant into an Erlenmeyer flask to do a titration, but we're monitoring the pH as we go along. So that's kind of the general idea of the first one up there where it says you should be able to convey uh, what a titration curve is and how you, you go about doing it. It's just you got to have a pH probe, right? You have to be able to monitor the pH along the way, and it usually has to be quite a uh, precise piece of equipment as well. You can't do it with pH paper or something like that. That's not going to give you good good enough results. It's got to be with a pH meter. Okay. Um, the second thing is, should be able to identify or communicate the key features of any titration curve. Now, what I just drew there, that straight line where if you had an acid, you'd think it'd start acidic and then you add base and it just goes up kind of thing. Um, what happens when you're doing a titration is, yes, it will start down here. Like, let's say I do start with an, an acid solution down below, and I start adding base to it. Okay, well, let's actually title this. So let's title this uh, Strong Acid Titrated with Strong Base. That actually might get in the way where I wrote that, but that's okay. Hopefully I'll, I'll miss it. So generally speaking, any titration, if you're starting with an acid down below in the Erlenmeyer flask and you're adding a base, okay, obviously the, the initial pH is going to start. If here's 7, the initial pH is going to be down here somewhere. And obviously, depending on 
concentration of the acid, whether it's weak or strong, right? Those, the combination of those two factors will tell you where that pH is going to be. It'll be down here somewhere, obviously. So if I was starting with a strong acid as an example, it might start down here at pH of who knows what, low. Now that's at zero mils of the titrant added. So we haven't added any of the strong base out of the burette. Now, as you add your one mil, your two mils, your three mils, as you go along, what do you suspect is going to happen? Well, <clears throat> of course, you add the strong base into the strong acid. They neutralize each other. But imagine you've got this, okay, see if you can visualize it. You've got this mass of strong acid molecules floating around in the water. Okay, there's, there's lots of them. If you add a little bit of base, you might take a few of them away. So let's say you start with a um, hundred people in your front yard and every drop, drop of base is equivalent to you pulling away five people. Okay, well what happens is that, okay, you start with a hundred people and you add a drop of base, you remove five people because they neutralize, you still have 95 people on your front lawn, it's still pretty darn crowded. Right? So there's still, when you're talking about acid molecules, it's less acidic, but it's still pretty darn acidic. Right? 100 people versus 95 people still on your front lawn. It's still a lot of people. And even if you add another mill, well, okay, you're down to 90. There are still a lot of people. And you kind of get that idea that it's becoming less and less and less, but it's still pretty darn strong. And it's not until you get to that last, you know, handful of people now you're down to 15 people you add another drop and now you're down to 10. now it's getting significantly less and less and less down to five and then boom down to zero all of a sudden gone and then you add another group of people on there now you've got five of your base out there on the lawn like the other side of the coin so what i want you to to grasp is that this is not going to necessarily be a linear thing because pH is a logarithmic scale. Okay, and because it's a logarithmic scale, that concentration, sorry, pH is the negative log of the concentration of the hydronium. And so what happens is it's not going to be a straight line. Okay? And it, instead, what it's going to be is it will be, it'll start to rise. I'm like, don't. Don't misunderstand me here. It will rise. It's just maybe not going to rise quite as much as you think it's going to rise. And it will rise and rise and rise and rise and rise. And then all of a sudden, what will happen, and this is typical for all titrations, is there will be this moment where you think, ooh, something's changing here. And that, ooh, something's changing here, will be a, a change in the slope. Like, it'll start to curve up. Now, if you're doing a titration that has an indicator in it, it's usually at that point where you're starting to get that splash of the indicator and you're going, ooh, boy, it's getting really close here. I'm getting a sense I'm only a drop or two away. And so you go drop, drop. And then you know how when you're doing a titration, sometimes one drop takes you two equivalents, maybe even takes you past the color that you're going for. Like you miss the transition color altogether. Because what happens is it will go and go, and when you get that sense, sure enough, it literally just fires, almost straight up. It's not technically straight up, but it's almost straight up, okay? Now, it's during that really steep rise, and every single titration will have this rapid, massive change. One, it's a very small range of what the volume of titrant added is. Right, it's like a drop or a half a drop will make that massive change in pH. It's also, keep in mind, that rapid change right there means the indicator is going to change color in there somewhere. Right, That rapid change is going to create the change in the, the color of the, of the indicator. And so that's going to be where our endpoint is. Our endpoint is going to be in this, this steep, section where it's going to change pH. And that was our concept 
behind why the indicator works in the first place. Because when you're adding the acid and the base, when you get to that equivalence point, the acid and the base have been used up entirely. You don't have those things anymore. You have entirely products. Right? And so the solution has the pH of whatever those products are. And typically you're making water and some salt. And that salt, depending on what type of titration you're doing, that salt gives you a certain pH of a solution. Okay? Regardless, you don't have any of the acid and the base over on the reactant side. So you're getting this massive change in pH because you don't have those things. Now, if you go past this rapid change, it's almost as if you continue doing the titration, but you keep just adding in the titrant, whatever it was. So if I was keeping a titration curve and monitoring pH along the way, right, every mill or whatever it is, I'm adding some base into an acid. It's going, it's going, it's going. Oh, here it goes, here it goes. Oh, rapid. But if you weren't using an indicator or all you were doing is monitoring the pH, if you just kept adding base, well, it's like you're adding base onto a solution that had already been neutralized. And so you're just adding more base to kind of a diluted solution. So it continues to get more and more basic, but not super rapidly because really you're just adding base into a big pile of generally neutral solution. So this massive change right here, then, yeah, see I did kind of get in the way, I'm going to remove my title here. And what will happen is that will just kind of slowly plateau. I mean it will continue to get as close to the pH of the titrant that you're adding in, like if it was just pure, it'll never quite get to that because it's always going to be diluted a little bit, but it will hit some maximum value and actually just plateau and go on forever. You could add base all you wanted to. Now you're going to get this very typical shape with all titration curves, all of them. What you will get is you will get a rapid change from acid to base or base down to acid if, it, if you're doing it the other way around. So the rapid change is really important to recognize. The rapid change is where your equivalence point is going to be. Okay, I'm going to let that kind of sink in your mind for a sec. The rapid change on a curve is where the equivalence point is going to be. Now, if this was a strong acid, versus a strong base, okay, so this is, say, the, the titration of an HCl solution using standardized sodium hydroxide. Let's pretend that was the titration. Well, the, the HCl solution started out really acidic. We started adding sodium hydroxide. pH did change a little bit because you're using up a little bit of the acid, but nothing too, too major, and then all of a sudden it goes, up it goes because you go through the equivalence point as a matter of fact like you just go zipping right on through it and then you just add more and more base okay, and it just is now a basic solution HCl is all used up so now you're just adding NaOH so it's almost like you didn't care about the equivalence point right when you're doing a curve you don't care about the equivalence point you want the data so that you can build the curve once you've got the data to build the curve then you can analyze the curve. Like now I've got this picture on, on my computer or on a piece of paper or wherever I've got my titration curve. Now I can apply the concepts of what I know so far about titration. So if this is a strong, strong titration, strong, strong titrations always produce water and a neutral salt because the conjugates are always spectators strong strong things they're always spectators so you end up with a neutral salt floating around in water at equivalence therefore the pH at equivalence of a strong strong titration is always seven so on my graph where is the equivalence point the equivalence point is wherever pH 7 hits that curve right so I pull out my ruler and I draw a straight line 
over to my curve. And I say to myself, okay, I know that for a strong, strong HCl and NaOH, for example, that at pH 7, that's where the equivalence is going to occur. So here it is on my graph. So what volume of base did it take to get to the equivalence point? Well, we didn't use an indicator. We're using our graph to tell us that value. So then you take your ruler. And you read, you read right off of your graph, you say the volume of base to reach the equivalence point. And so you can take the data from the pH probe as you're doing the titration. You can draw the curve, and then using your understanding of the theory of a strong, strong titration, you can then say, well, here's where the equivalence point occurred. Okay. Now, generally speaking, okay, and kind of throw this one out there for the next video as well with the strong, weak titration curves. Generally speaking, the middle of the steep section I don't know if I quite hit that perfectly. I'm just kind of freehanding this picture. Generally speaking, the middle of the steep section is where the equivalence point will be. And so for a strong strong, the middle of that steep section will typically be right at pH of 7. Now for those of you who have calculus, the true point of where the equivalence point will be on the titration curve is the inflection point, where the slope starts to change. Okay, so the first derivative when you can find the inflection point, that's where the actual equivalence point will be. That happens to be for a strong, strong titration at pH of 7. So if anybody ever puts a graph out there in front of you and says, what was being titrated? Strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base, what was being titrated? This is an identifying feature. Well, at zero mils of titrant added, it was an acidic pH. So obviously this is in the acid category. It's either strong or weak acid. Then you look at the graph and you say, well, where is that equivalence point? Like the middle of the steep section. And that middle of the steep section was right at pH of 7. If it occurs at pH of 7, this must have been a strong acid being titrated. And so therefore, like, let's pretend you do a titration curve you know that you've got an acidic solution. You just don't know if it's a strong or weak acid. Like you have no idea what it is, but you know it's acidic because you put the pH probe in and then sure enough, it's down here. Then you do a titration curve. Like you collect the data. You actually do a titration with sodium hydroxide. You titrate that acid, you collect the data, you draw the curve and you go, oh, well the equivalence point happened at seven. This unknown acid must have been a strong acid. Which of the ones it is, I'm not really sure, but it's one of the strong ones, okay? So you can actually use the titration curves to do a lot of things in terms of identifying an acid. And the very first thing that you can do is identify a strong substance because of the very typical titration curve and the shape of the, the titration curve that you get from it, okay? So we're going to come back next class, and we are going to... Um, we're going to do strong versus weak titrations, which um, same general concept of how do you get a titration curve, put a probe in, you do the titration, you collect the data and draw, draw the graph, pH versus volume of titrant. But there's some unique things that, that come out of it, and it takes a little bit more of an explanation to explain why the curves look different um, and what you can learn from those curves as well. Okay, so ho hopefully that helped you out a little bit. Uh, if you're in a lab and you're doing a titration curve, lots of things you can do with it. You can, you can identify what it is, and not only that, you can figure out the volume that it took. Without using an indicator, you can figure out where the equivalence was, and you could do the concentration as well, because you now know the volume of whatever it took to titrate it. Okay, so uh, we'll see you in next class for strong versus weak titration curves. Okay, we'll see you then.